it's going to lead into the next question that I have because there is really like a, you're walking a tightrope when you're doing that because there are well-funded evangelical groups that are like kind of a double-edged sword for Jews. They support Jewish survival in Israel, but often work to convert us. So I'm not saying they all do, you know, but a lot of them do. Like, for example, like John Hagee uh, is one famous example. Um, as a former Christian missionary, you now raise awareness of Jewish evan evangelism, its danger to the Jewish people, and encourage safe and consistent boundaries in interfaith relationships of Jewish communities. How do we enforce those boundaries? Like, while maintaining strong relationships with our Christian friends, a lot of Jewish blood was spilled over centuries at the hands of Christian oppressors. So naturally, Jews have welcomed this new iteration of a Jew-friendly Christianity, uh, which makes things very complicated, because we 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 don't we do want to accept their hand in friendship, but at the same time, like, are they being? How do we know? Like, where where do we draw the line? Because they're going to come in, let's say, fund a soup kitchen. Um, and we want to welcome them, them and, and they're going to, you know, they're going to become part of our lives in a way, whether it's in politics or any, any, you know, aspect of society, we're going to be involved with them, especially in Israel. Where do we draw the line? How do we create these boundaries without like offending them and also while keeping the relationship? Yeah. Right. Um, I will tell you, they, they tend to exploit their love for Israel and their their generosity and their charity to the jewish people they exploit it um to a point where boundaries are crossed and and red lines are are crossed uh, in proselytizing and we allow it we, we shouldn't be allowing it we need to be strong enough to keep those boundaries in place and say this is a red line that you can't cross and uh, christians are commanded from their own bible to support israel and uh you know bless israel um what is that genesis yeah if you bless us if you bless, bless israel you'll be blessed and you curse israel you'll be cursed that is that is a commandment that they are obligated to keep no matter what, and uh, but that doesn't include proselytizing, and we need to be strong enough to put those boundaries in place and say, we appreciate your support. We appreciate you standing with us. You, we appreciate you rallying and advocating with us in, in um, issues like anti-Semitism, and uh, you know feeding the poor but we draw the line when it comes to proselytizing and I, I don't believe that any um anybody who we know who has that agenda should have a uh, should be a direct provider of support for vulnerable people mm. and we just we just need to be strong enough to put those boundaries in place and that is through our leaders and we yeah. need to hold our we need to hold our leaders responsible. You're and talking about religious leaders who, or political leaders, both, really. Religious leaders, political leaders, because there are le there are laws that need to be put in place to but keep these boundaries. There are leader. religious leaders that are opening the door and uh, vouching for them, letting them in. So, unfortunately, money talks. You hmm. know, in in both worlds, it in does money money ego. And the fact that we're we're in a rough neighborhood here in Israel, yes. we are surrounded by enemies, and a lot of people say we need all the friends we can get, and this right. is too dangerous too dangerous of a situation to uh, turn it away. We've also been trained by the Christian world that we need them. Um, we have you know big leaders. I know there's a very famous museum now which is, uh, it was opened and run by Mike Evans, who's a Christian leader. And you walk in, and the first thing that you hear is Benjamin Netanyahu's voice. And he says, without, without the support of Christian Zionists, the state of Israel would not exist today. Wow. And that's the message for the whole museum. And basically, we owe everything to the Christian Zionists. We owe everything to the evangelicals. And without them, we wouldn't exist. And 
that shouldn't be the message because we exist because God promised we would exist and, and no matter what he's going to protect us. And it's him that it, we're, is responsible. Um, and Christians can, you know, choose to follow that verse in Genesis or choose not to, um, they can bless or they can curse and that's, that's up to them. But I don't think that, uh, that doesn't obligate us to allow them to cross these lines and convert our children and come after us like that. We've dealt with too many centuries of that. Well, you moved, if I'm not mistaken, you moved to Israel in 2015 and there was a population of uh, Jews for Jesus, like at around, I think you mentioned 15,000 and now it's doubled since then. Uh, right. And and that that to me means that like, we're, they're clearly not doing anything from either, either the religious or the um, political. political, but they're not taking it as a threat because to them it's like, what is this? It's a small number and it's not really so, it's not a big deal, but doubling in six, seven years is really scary. Yes. And um, right. like, so what are you doing? Because I, I, I do want to get into um, what you did with Hot TV, um, the biggest channel in Israel, which is in well, nine, I think 9 million homes in Israel. Right. They were going to have a 24 hour uh, even evangelical channel, basically trying to missionize to Jews, and you and Rabbi Singer were very heavily involved in shutting that down. So that's one great step. But and we hope there's going to be more people like you. Um, but what what are we doing on like, you know, to preempt like to preempt these things? Not not to react to these movements, but are we are you guys doing anything to kind of stop it in its tracks? Um, it can't be just you guys. Has it up. has to be the yeah. the entire Jewish world. And um, I've I've been in the counter missionary world for for um, fifteen years now, and much of it has been behind the scenes, uh, creating reports, showing, trying to show Jewish leadership the agenda, trying to do what I'm doing now, but directly with leadership, meeting with government leaders, going to Knesset, um, and meeting privately with a Jewish agency and big Jewish organizations. Um, before, I don't know if you know about the Jewish agency case, we exposed the Jewish agency was partnering with Christian missionaries. Before we exposed that case, I had been meeting with Jewish agency leaders, first with Natan Sharansky, and then with uh, Herzog himself for five years and showing them that this organization that they were partnering with that was running Jewish agency programs are missionaries. You have to do something about it. And I guess they were just paying me lip service and, and it would, you know, go away. And so going to government leaders wasn't working anymore. Um, I was frustrated. The reports I s seemed to be sending were, were uh, going nowhere. I had been getting these newsletters from God TV and Ron Cantor about this new TV station that they had gotten a license for. And I had been going to journalists. I had been going to different people in the government and saying, do you see what they're doing? They flat out say in their newsletter, that they're going to convert my 9 million Jews and you gave them a TV station and nobody was listening. And it was during the time of COVID. Um, I, again, I'm going to credit Rabbi Singer. He edits all of his own videos. And uh, I said, I wanted to learn how to do that. Asked him what software he used. It's COVID. I'm locked in for we're all like in lockdown i'm going to learn how to edit my own videos and i learned the editing software and i said you know what i've been trying to get people to listen and see these these missionaries and what they're saying i'm going to i'm going to put this ward simpson guy who he had like several uh, 20 minute clips i like took the most important statements that he said and put them uh, in a little five minute clip and I put it up on the internet and it went viral overnight. I said, for six months, I'd been trying to tell people, 
myself trying to tell them what they were doing and they weren't listening. But when they saw it on video, out of his own mouth, his own words, hmm. that was powerful. And exactly uh, he, was he was saying that his goal is to convert 9 million Jews. Yes. He said, we've, we've got the license to broadcast the gospel of Jesus Christ to all of Israel, and we're going to convert 9 million Jews to Christianity. And he said it over and over and over again in different ways. He had other people saying it. All of Tel Aviv is going to hell, and we need to bring this TV station so we can get the gospel of, of Jesus into every Israeli home, and we can reach the children. And it was... It was uh, very shocking, mm. and that was what that was what people needed. They needed to hear it out of their own mouths. And when they so, see the children, when they mention the children, you're not really allowed to missionize to children, according right. to right, right? So is that like the kind of the the uh, nail in the coffin that you that you relied on? Like, hey, you know, they're actually proselytizing to children, so we got to do something about this. Oh, that's the loophole. That had a lot to do with. Uh, with the method and and why um, I guess they had to reapply for their license. And then in, in the meantime, it was the public outrage that was brought about. So it was, and that is why I say it can't be just you guys. Um, and right. that is why I changed the way I did things. I no longer go directly to leadership. I'm, I've, I've found that that is useless um, in the only time unfortunately, that our leaders are forced to do something or um, change something is when there's public pressure and there's outrage. Mm -hmm. And it took, it took everybody being very angry and everybody saying, telling the leaders, this can't happen and this is wrong. You're saying that that was Israeli. why it was successful. Israelis. You're saying Israeli, like secular Israelis too, had a problem with it? Or most Every Israeli. We also started a petition um, against Hot TV, which was the cable provider that was carrying the stations. So when all of the subscribers of Hot TV threatened to cancel their subscriptions if they allowed this TV station, Hot TV was also under pressure to... Uh, to cancel them so that worked that it was also the same way that uh jewish agency uh severed their partnership you know for five years i'd been trying to show that they were wow that they were proselytizing i found videos fortunately the money that supports these groups doesn't come from israel israelis aren't yeah. supporting these groups they are beholden to their supporters in America, which means that they have to produce content and they have to go to the churches and talk about what they're doing in Israel, or they have to produce videos and talk about what they're doing in Israel. And when they do, they boast about what they're doing and they describe the tactics that they're doing. They say how they're doing it and what they're doing it, and they show it on video. Wow. So when I get those videos that are not meant for a Jewish audience, they're obviously meant for their Christian supporters, and show that these people are Muslim soldiers and these people are going after Olim, um, then that was brought to the public and the Jewish agency was forced to sever that relationship. Wow. You, you really, you and Rabbi Singer and your organization have saved so many souls you know you you might have some guilt inside oh i i converted some jews to you know christianity but on the on the in the big picture what you've done is like you you have a very big impact on jewish history you, 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 you don't you don't realize it we don't realize it but it it's it's huge it's so much bigger than we can even imagine so thank you so much for doing that because that's you know we owe it to you and rabbi singer and people like you and I, I'm hoping that there's, are, are there are there people like you who are, like, because obviously Rabbi Singer is getting up there in age, are, are the, do you guys train others to kind of be counter missionaries? Because I feel like in the religious world, there isn't. It's a missing, yeah, it's like, a missing element. Right, like people don't really find this to be a problem because mm -hmm. it may be, because it, you're not, you're not feeling an immediate um, impact from it. So you kind of brush it up, oh, someone else will handle it. Someone else will deal with it. Um, you know, like like the guy, like the Haredi guy who hands the book, 
you know, oh, this is we or listen to this tape. You know, that's that's people's reaction. They don't, they don't, they're not equipped. A lot of it has to do with in the religious world. You know, a lot of Jews are not familiar with Tanakh. They don't want to deal with these problems. Um, that's a separate issue. I won't tell Rabbi Singer that you said he's getting old. <laughs> well, listen, I, I don't have a stream. We hope he's gonna, you know, God willing, to be here a long right. time. But we need people like him, and we hope that there are other people Please, being, God. being trained to do this job uh, because it's so it's so important. And what I want to really um, end on is your organization. Uh, because, you know, you were responsible for uncovering missionaries who lived outwardly as Haredi Jews, such as the Elk family. I want to talk about them or if you have any other ones uh, before we go. And if you can just give us some background on this, um, because I, I can't imagine, you know, uh, someone who's dressed as an ultra-Orthodox Jew is coming to my shul and so integrated, like the Elk family, like the, the, this person was a, was a Mohel. And he was he was uh, you know doing circumcisions. He he was a rabbi. He was I don't know if he was was he a shochet also. Uh, he was a kohen. He was a sofer. He was a word. And like I I feel like my my BS meter is pretty you know sharp that I can I could catch on. But you, you got to be really really good to just know know that really well prepared to know all the lingo and to integrate into that world so seamlessly and get to such a high position. So, like, can you explain how that happened? And there's other cases of that as well. Yeah. Um, well, first, the work that Rabbi Singer does is is so important. And um, he's really focused on the Christian world and the Jews that are um, in the Christian world, bringing the Jews that are there back to Judaism and in countering the texts and showing the, uh, the contradictions in, in the, uh, new te from the new Testament to Tanakh and why Jesus doesn't fulfill that. Uh, Benenu's role has been mostly, uh, just saying, you know, from my own experience and being a missionary myself, uncovering the agenda and trying to educate the Jewish world. I don't work in the Christian world at all whatsoever. My, I feel like my mandate and, and my um, reason for starting B'nai is to educate the Jewish world and to expose the agenda in both um, evangelical Christianity and uncovering these really deceptive tactics that we're seeing. And we talked about how the messianic movement began with incorporating Jewish symbols and icons. And it is only amped up as the Christian world feels they're closer and closer to the end times, which I don't even think we brought about why they target the Jews, which the reason they target the Jews is they believe that it is the conversion of a Jew that will bring about the second coming of Jesus. And as we get closer and closer, they feel there's such a desperate need and they feel that Orthodox Jews are an unreached people group. You can Google that term, unreached people groups, and they call it a 1040 window, the most, the least missionized people in the world. And we're the least missionized people in the world because we tend to seclude ourselves, isolate ourselves, separate ourselves. We have, we, you know, um, have private schools, we have communities, we insulate ourselves from uh, that influence. So the only way to target and, and uh, encounter a religious Jew is to get inside. And in order to do that, they have amped up the messianic movement to such a level that you're seeing things like El Cohen and uh, we've had exposed many others. And you ask the way they do that. It is, it is something they're committed to long-term. Um, he started and went through this process many, many years. There's ones that we just exposed not long ago that uh, we're doing this for much less years, but they begin in America, and a lot of times the entry is through Chabad. And um, 
a lot of people are critical about the rabbis who allow this or fall for this, but there are a lot of really good, um, kind-hearted, outreach-focused rabbis out there um, who want to help every Jew. And if you come in and say you're a Jew, no matter what your background is, those kind of um, outreach type rabbis are taken advantage of because they're going to help you and they're going to do everything they can to help you. Um, so if you come in and say you're a Balchuva, they they help and you become you become part of the community and you learn and then you start learning Daf Yomi with the rabbi and then you move to another community and you name drop some of the Jews you know from the other community. And as you move, and you'll notice in every covert missionary situation, they've moved several times. Um, I, the Dawsons were like 10 states that we had, we had uh, spread the whole investigation through. And only, as you name drop and yeah. build this false narrative, your your Jewish identity just gets stronger and stronger. And in the case of El Cohen and a couple of the others, each place they went to, they had some story or some way that they obtained another Jewish document, a, a get or a uh, you know um, a uh, El Cohen was you know building up titles and certifications in the Jewish world. And I think it, you asked, how does that happen? Um, you know, even now, when when a religious Jew comes into the shul, and you know, most most shuls will give you an aliyah when you know if you're a guest visiting for the first time. We don't ask, are you a Jew? And we don't ask them to prove that they're a Jew when they come in. Um, and a lot of times, if they're going to a a religious school. We we do need to start asking, especially when they're uh, trying to come into the schools. But who ever thought that a Christian missionary was going to go to a smicha program? <laughs> yeah, great. If you to apply to a smicha program, they're not asking you if you're to prove that you're Jewish. It's it was not even a question until now. It's crazy because, like, the level of commitment they have to like, doing all these mitzvot and living that life, it's like mm -hmm. a lot of Jews can learn a lot from that. If we had that enough, kind of commitment, that, um, yeah. yeah, it's crazy to live that kind of right. thing. So how did how did you bust this family? Because it's a very sensitive issue. Because if you're wrong, and if you and you come out too early and you don't have enough evidence, then you ruin the whole family's life. You know that, that there's a, there's a lot of uh, guilt that will come with that and, and pain. So. How did you know, like, okay, this is it, that we have it, we know for a fact, and now we're ready to expose them? Absolutely. Um, that was a case that we had been building for, for quite a while. Um, and it was somebody on my team who had recognized that these were actually somebody that we had known in the past who gave, was forced to give a full conversion in, in writing and, uh, and verbally because they had been caught before and that was in 2014 and at that time elk had said i i'm i want to do tshuva and in the jewish world that's a sacred word and everybody should have the ability to do tshuva and said that i didn't want to i don't want to live a double life anymore um, so they gave a full confession and went back to, to living their life, assuming that they had really done tshuva, um, until somebody on our team said, wait a minute, they've got two profiles, and she's sick now, and she's building funds, and she's she's got a profile in the Christian world building funds there, and the Christ, a, a profile in the Jewish world. She said, we bet this is, I bet they're back to the same thing, and they never really, really left, and sure enough, we uh, had plenty of evidence very quickly. You know, he was brave enough to have gone on Christian TV um, preaching about Jesus and, and living as a covert missionary. He wrote a book uh, about living as a covert missionary among the Orthodox. And it, uh, it didn't take long before there was a mountain of evidence. And the 
journalists that we have been working with, the burden of proof is very high. There are a lot of things that were not published because, you know, to me, it was damning. It was, it was very, um, it was a smoking gun, but it wasn't enough for the legal department of the paper to print. So there was, um, there's not a single statement in, in the paper that does not have a mountain of evidence to, to support that statement behind it. And it does, it have, you have to be absolutely right. Um, one of them, I actually fought and said, there's no way this can't be. And I was the, I was the worst critic and, and wanted to give them the, the benefit of the doubt because it was a family that I was personally involved with. And I just couldn't believe it, but uh, it did. It, I, uh, it turned out they were and found pictures of them, uh, you know, in some of the other cases and it all fell apart. And yeah. As, as you're living a double life, usually what happens from what I'm hearing about a lot of these stories is that you, you actually become more bold with your, um, you know, open, like you kind of, you're kind of like leaving breadcrumbs everywhere because you feel like, Hey, I haven't been caught till now. I can, I can be a little bit more, bold about it and then like I can start getting away with it and that's that's how they missionize but at the same time that's how they get caught hmm. so um right. so that I think that happened with this case as well Correct? with Elk yes he got more and more brave enough that he was living two lives and he was in the Jewish world um acting as a sofer and a mohel and uh teaching but in the Christian world, he was he was opening up a yeshiva and was giving messianic smicha. What's not in the papers and what you don't know, and was one of those things that didn't print, was that he had also been doing conversions. And there are conversion documents that have been accepted by the state of Israel for Aliyah. And there are at least 10 more families that were in the process of trying to find and expose that made Aliyah with conversion document by elk wow. so did he drop the cohen because obviously if everyone knows he's a convert now uh, he can't be a, a cohen i and think he's still he'll, he's still going by El cohen but he did shave his beard he's no longer masquerading as a religious jew his kids are not in religious schools now um so and i think it's very difficult to retroactively revoke somebody's citizenship sure um so the government has not done that. But I think in other ways, we have really um, sounded the alarm bells and really woken up the Jewish community. And if that uh, we have a hotline, we have a, a email, we have a website to report things, and I'm inundated with reports all the time. So I, I do see that people's eyes are opened, they are concerned, um, and this is on their radar which in the past has not been, and it's, it's a good thing. It is an amazing thing. Thank you so much for making this happen. Uh, this was unbelievable. And uh, we're going to hopefully spread it around to as many people as we can. Yeah. And we're telling our listeners now, please share this with people. You might not think this is a, an issue that directly affects us, but it does. So uh, thank you so much. And, Keep up uh, the good work. Yes. Your story is, uh, is an incredible inspiration. And uh, we hope that anybody listening, um, you know, everyone within their own situations and its own context, but anybody listening should uh, acquire strength through your story uh, to be able to face challenges, um, to be able to strive for truth, strive for truth. And, and I think that as, as we get older and, you know, when you have a family and, and, and you have friends and community, uh, the search for truth becomes less. Because you're more, you're kind of already set in your ways. Set in your ways. You're in your, you know, um, you uh, you were able to overcome that, and that is incredible. Um, and we hope that anybody listening will be inspired through that um, to be able to renew their search, search for truth. And uh, regarding the work that you do, it's just incredible. And we will try our best to spread the word and do good things. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Awesome. Bye. Bye-bye.